What's good, y'all? Welcome back. We are now ready to formally state the coupled pendulum problem in a succinct manner. So suppose that we have a coupled pair of pendulum, each one composed of a mass attached to a long rod with length L, and that the two masses on the ends of these two pendula are connected together by a spring with spring constant K. Of course, we can measure each mass using some sort of a scale, and we say that the left mass or first mass has mass M1, and the right mass has mass M2. We attach a ruler below the masses that we can use to measure positions. And then the couple pendulum problem is if we set one of these masses into motion, so if I take the right mass and move it, and then let the entire system swing back and forth, our challenge, if we choose to accept it, is to predict the exact location of each center of mass along the ruler. Here's another way to say that. If I only know masses m1, m2, the length of the pendulum, and the spring constant, when those things go in motion, I'm going to get some sort of position function. So here what I've done is I've taken the right mass, displaced it a little bit, and then let those masses swing back and forth over time. And notice that if we plot the position versus time, or in this case, the displacement versus time, there's a kind of complex back and forth motion. And the pendulum problem is describe those functions explicitly. Write them like, I don't know, u1 equals something times cosine plus something times sine, etc. Not only do we want to be able to write those functions, but the functions that we actually converge on, the things that we end up deciding describe our system, we should be able to compare to the real dynamics of the system to measured data on the McCusker apparatus and see whether or not our mathematical prediction have value. We should be able to verify our model. As I claimed previously, this coupled pendulum problem is actually an eigenvalue problem in disguise where the matrix A is two by two because we have two components in our system. We have two separate masses that we want to track the position of as we observe this system. This is a keystone application. This problem highlights both themes that we saw in our introductory video, and it sets a foundation for more advanced stages. As we study this problem and get more familiar with the dynamics, I wanna put a few ideas in your head so that you can return to these over and over again. When we're trying to figure out the behavior of our system, we're gonna focus on two very special cases that show up as those masses move. The first special case is going to be known as mode one of our system, and that corresponds to something called the first natural frequency. In this situation, what will happen is we will perturb, we will displace both masses the same amount, and then as they move together, they're gonna to kind of be coupled so that the function that describes the left mass is identical to the function that describes the right mass. In that case, the first eigenvalue of the system is going to be related to the period of that motion. The second special case we're going to call mode two, and that's the second natural frequency. We say natural because think about how a pendulum swings back and forth. Notice that that pendulum swing kind of looks like it creates a cosine curve. So naturally uncoupled, a pendulum would create a cosine. So when we're thinking about natural frequencies, it's the frequency or the function that the pendulum naturally wants to take. The fact that the pendulum are coupled by a spring changes the dynamics, except in these special cases. So for mode two, associated with the second eigenvector and eigenvalue pair, lambda two times x two, we're gonna claim that the behavior of the displacement, the behavior of this function, matches a pure cosine curve or a pure periodic function, and the eigenvalue lambda two is gonna be related to the frequency of these periodic functions. One of the most awe-inspiring features of our process of translating the coupled pendulum problem into an eigenvalue problem is when we have the mixed mode oscillation. When we set 
both masses with separate displacements, so they're not the same, and they're kind of doing this crazy complex functional behavior, the claim is that if I have information about mode one and mode two, the solution to this more complex behavior is going to come as a linear combination of the first two modes. And I literally mean linear combination as in linear algebra, which means that we translate a very, very hard problem into the sum of two much easier problems. When we first started this class, I promised that we were going to see examples of applied math modeling in action. And we had this diagram where we went from a real world problem to an ideal mathematical model to an ideal solution, to a meaningful real-world solution, this coupled pendulum problem relying on standard eigenvalue problems is an example of this. So for example, when we start with the coupled pendulum problem, that is a continuous problem and exists in time and space. And the behavior of that problem depends on continuous functions and what we call differential equations. One of the things that we're going to see is we're going to mathematize that problem. We're going to turn it into an algebraic problem. So that means turn a problem from calculus into a problem in algebra. Turn a problem that involves continuous function into a problem that relies only on scalar valued variables. Once we do that, we're going to have our transformed standard eigenvalue problem. And then we're going to apply eigenvalue theory from this introductory class to be able to come up with eigenvalue solutions. So the two solutions we're going to have are the mode one and mode two solutions. That literally comes from looking at a two by two matrix. Not so hard. Then we're going to do inverse mathematization or reverse mathematization. We're going to think about the structures that we use to transform our continuous problem into our discrete problem. We're going to undo those structures and interpret the meaning of these solutions in the continuous paradigm. When we do that, of course, we got to make sure that the model that we've generated actually works. And I am really serious about this point. You should not have to look at me and trust me when I say this stuff works. In fact, I want you to actively not believe me. The real test of this is not my word, my authority. The real test is you take your own model look at the original measurements that we take on the McCusker apparatus and compare the modeled behavior to your own measurements. And the question is, how closely do they align? Where they don't align, why is the model inaccurate? With that in mind, by way of our introduction to the standard eigenvalue problem, we're going to take our real world problem, study it and understand it. That takes time. It takes a lot of time to be able to understand and state a meaningful problem in the world around us. Once we do that, we're going to learn how to transform that problem into a mathematical statement that looks like a matrix times a vector equals lambda times that vector. That matrix will encapsulate the dynamics of the system. We're then going to use theory from linear algebra to get an ideal solution called the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs of that matrix. And then we're going to map back and verify our model. In the next video, we're going to start our mathematization process to see how we form this matrix and set up our eigenvalue problem. I'll see you there.